you know, I'm always fascinated when you get these big pay-per-view fights. Uh, I didn't get to, you know, watch the the Jake Paul uh, versus Fury fight. Uh, Tommy Fury, right? I believe Tommy Fury. Yeah, there you go. Tommy Fury, not Tyson, not Tyson. No, Tyson would have won without been... uh, without going eight rounds. <laughs> he for sure would have. Um, but no, I I always find it funny because it's like it, it, you you can't really get a better encapsulation of two just major egos uh, on either side of a fight, right? So it's like you you get a a first glance at a front row seat to just the sheer ecstasy of winning and the the yeah. embarrassing you know nature and just the utter shock of defeat instantly during, when they call you know especially when it's like a split decision yeah. like it was here um you just saw Jake Paul just completely deflated cuz he did also i believe make a, like a bet saying if i lose then I will give all of my money or whatever that he was going to make off of the fight to to Tommy and vice versa. It was an all or nothing deal. So it's like when you put that much out there, but yeah, you could just see, uh, you know, Tommy felt so validated and, uh, and Jake Paul just devastated, but yeah, you get, you get, there's no more raw emotion you can get than uh, immediately after a fight. Absolutely. I, I, and I think you, um, you do look at it and you, you laugh a little bit because both people had, Logan, Logan was the one, um, or Jake was the one that had the most to lose, but Tommy was the one who had the most to gain. And because people were starting to really consider Jake Paul, like a legitimate, like yep, boxing yep. prospect and where fury has always been, well, he's Fury's little brother. He's, he's the pretty boy. He's not a real boxer. Uh, everyone he's fought is like a total, like joke sparring partners and people aren't real professionals. And now right, right. him winning that is first off, it's a win for the boxers because this is the first real, I guess. And I say real boxer and, and Tommy Fury is not even a real boxer that Jake has fought. And, um, you know, a lot of people were saying uh, that, ma that maybe they felt Jake should have won, but it wasn't like outrage that, Oh my God, Jake lost. It was a split decision. What I saw it, you're right. It is the, um, it, for your Jake Paul, you just say to yourself, crap like where do i go where do i go from here like tommy fury had ducked him before this was supposed to be the kind of a big payday and maybe even start his legitimate boxing career and you lose uh it's a it's a gut punch for sure that, that i'm not i'm not big on the paul brothers but at least jake is legitimately trying to make something of himself yeah. in a in a venue in a sport in a in a way logan is uh I mean, I think Logan was the one who did the video in the Japanese forest yes. and the stuff like yeah. that. Like, you know, it just comes across as very unredeeming. Yes. A very, that's a great yeah. way to say it. Very unredeeming. Yeah. Yeah. Or it might be non-redeem. I, I don't know. I don't, I don't know the word, but, but yeah, he's I'm going to go with dude. that. He's, he's, <laughs> yeah. 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 There, there's a hard. Yeah. And I'm, you know, Jake might be too. Um, yeah. But at least like you said, like, I, Hey man, you got to respect the, uh, the amount of effort that that these guys have to put into training and stuff. That's why I've always I've always gravitated towards boxing more than UFC. And the UFC is so spectacular in the presentation, and that's yeah, why it can be more entertaining. Boxing has always been uh, something I I've gravitated towards mainly because of the there's there has to be so much attention to detail because you you're only a, a allowed to work with a you know more limited uh, set of skills. Yeah. There's one guy one guy could be a dominant kicker uh while someone's got amazing ground game in UFC or something like that. And I do they, they're both totally different. I just it's more of a preference thing. I always thought boxing was cool in that aspect because it's really just like you're honing in like who who had the better skill set today uh when it comes to just sparring and um and that's that's always kind of uh, been interesting, but well, I've never really had the money to watch these things because you yeah, got to pay know, so much to get it. You know, I don't. They're killer. Uh, I don't want to. Uh, you got to find the right bar that has it on. You know what I right, mean? Yeah. Who's got a good like bucket of beer special, and you go sit there and, and watch <laughs> exactly. it. I I do that for. I like heavyweight boxing, so it, it's it's not shocking. Definitely at heavyweight. All. I would yeah, hundred percent. In our that. in our lifetimes, I mean, we're both in our early thirties. Boxing, especially by the time we were old enough to really consume it. In you know our early teens, boxing was dead in America. Yeah, we it has come heyday. back in the last five years because of Wilder, Fury, Anthony Joshua, Ruiz, 
uh, some of the heavyweight boxers. You actually can name them, uh, and 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 especially Wilder Fury. It got me really into like watching the heavyweight stuff. Um, and, and so yeah, I agree with you. UFC is is so violent. Like I struggle with UFC a little bit. Like the violence of of it's, UFC. It's hard to watch. Yeah, it's, it is uh, a little hard to watch. Um, boxing is is like beautifully violent. It's like a beautiful violent game in that way. Um, but mixed martial arts, smart sports, all of that, it can be really, really, um, it can be really, really boring sometimes. Like if you get a bad sure. fight, like a bad fight and you pay for it can be, can be brutal. Unlike I think with team sports where there's always still something to watch for. Cause you could be like, um, for example, Damian Lillard scored 71 last night for the yeah. trailblazers versus the Rockets. They're playing the worst team in the NBA and the Blazers aren't that good anyways, but you at least get like, Oh, this game may not be good, but Lillard's going off tune in and just watch Lillard. You know what I mean? Right. Right. Yeah. Yeah. There's, there's something else that you can look forward to out of that aspect. Yeah. That's crazy, man. I also saw you had the highest, uh, uh, what was it? Uh, like a, uh, a TS percentage for anyone over 70 points in a game or something like that. Um, oh. but no, I mean, that, that's, it's impressive what that guy can do, man. I was imagine him on the Lakers or something. You know? Like imagine him with uh with LeBron and and AD. That'd be a force. But we are here to talk football. Don't uh, don't worry, folks. Uh, but we just you know it's it's the off season and uh, and we we had some other uh, you know things to to take note of there. So um, glad we were able to touch on that. But obviously, as we get ready for the uh, combine coming up here shortly, and then uh, of course the draft in late April. We're looking ahead to all things off season, and you know we're going to focus primarily on the uh, the two quarterbacks that are being talked about the most in the league right now. That's Lamar Jackson of the Baltimore Ravens and Derek Carr of the free agent free agents. Um, <laughs> yeah. And uh, and then we'll talk Bears as well because they have been in the uh, you know the the news a lot recently about what they might do with the no- number one overall pick. And I just got to say, you know, maybe we can actually start there, Mark, if, if you're cool with that. Because, That's fine with me. Uh, I love the fact, and obviously I'm not not diehard Bears, but I, I love the fact that the Bears are at the forefront of the discussion. That is the great thing about holding the cards, yeah. especially when everyone knows that you probably don't need that number one overall pick. So they're at the forefront of all these national discussions right now. What are they going to do with this pick? How far are they willing to trade down? Who are they going to partner up with? There's so many scenarios that are fascinating to kind of view, but the, you know, reports coming out yesterday and over the weekend were that the bears are very heavily considering and leaning towards moving out of that number one spot. It's something that we anticipated yeah. pretty much from the jump, but now that it looks like things are even becoming more and more solidified that they for sure are going to be moving out of that spot. Are you consoled by this fact and what do you make of of these reports or do you think it's just all kind of uh you know a fugazi if you will uh kind of a smoke screen to more just get the more and more that they can out of this pick well I, I i mean i'll start with the fact that i remember saying on this show i said on my own show the day after the season ended and the bears locked up that number one pick i said very firmly my stance on what I thought they should do with Justin Fields. Cause everyone, I, you knew immediately people were going to start saying yeah. Justin Fields talk. I am 110%. I've been it uh, since uh, that, since Monday night football against the Patriots, when they finally, un, you know, changed things up, unleashed this kind of new Justin Fields offense and showed you the potential that he really has. Um, I've been, I've been on, you need to support Justin Fields. He needs to be your guy. Uh, through the length of this rookie contract, and you need to try to win with him on this rookie contract over the next um, going into year three. So you have year three, year four, and then picking up that fifth year option, right? So really having three full years now of building with Justin Fields, and um, the first overall pick could be such a uh, a a fast start, a, a jump ahead, an easy way to a quick fix a ton of things uh, to rebuild quicker. Um, my thought is 
Adam, if Adam Schefter's tweeting it and he released it on social media, that's really got the firestorm started this morning that the Bears have, have leaning towards decided to trade the pick. What that means to me, if I'm trying to read between the lines, is that the Bears have an offer they really like, but they're trying to force the hand of someone else who they're close with or maybe a better deal to be like, yeah. come on, let's get this done. So that is Schefter making it public that now, hey, you know, the Bears behind. We've got buyers, doors. so you we've better up your buyer. offer. Yeah, we've yeah. got a buyer we really like. We're yeah. close to doing this. So it's now or never like put, you know, and, and as soon as that news comes out, Ryan Pohl's phone was even was ringing even more today. He was doing like the conversations have intensified. I would imagine within the next um, week or two, the deal, a, a, a preliminary deal will get done with the bears moving out of it. So then you start looking right at where's the landscape go. And there's some people who think different things. There's a lot of people who think the bears want to go back to two or four Texans or Colts at two it with the Texans four at the Colts um, and then try to trade back even more again um, because there, it doesn't seem as though because there's not that Trevor Lawrence type definitive number one, it, it doesn't seem as though anyone's going to give them that hail Mary mega deal from, you know, the 10 through 15 or 10 through 20 spot. Because how you get the most for your your capital is what San Francisco had to do. San Fran to get Trey Lance to give up, what, three first-rounders and all that, they went from, like, 15 to three. Going from the teens to the top three is that, those gigantic mega deals, right? Trading from two to one or two to four, you have to give up less because you're getting, in return, the second or the fourth pick, and you're and so you're still getting yourself a top-five player in the draft, right? which the Bears need a top five player in the draft. Don't get me wrong. But I, I do love the idea of the Bears going from one to two or one to four and then moving back again within the top 10 or just outside the top 10 and getting even more future first round considerations. Part of the reason why I love this, and I'm just going to say it, I got to put it out there, is that next year, there seems to be two very good A plus prospects, guys that if they were in this year's draft, Caleb Williams and Drake Mays, that if they were in this year's draft, they'd be the, the consensus one and two overall quarterbacks. So if the Bears put themselves in a spot to where they feel like, um, oh man, there's gonna be a run in quarterbacks next year, we have more capital to work with. We have all of we're gonna be in these good spots for quarterbacks next year as well. Either then, A, they could draft one themselves if things go badly with fields this, you know, upcoming year. Or, again, if they find themselves with a top five pick because someone else traded, say, Houston, or they get Indy's pick, but Indy ends up still as the worst team in the league next year. Well, they have Indy's pick. You know what I mean? If they work a deal sure. in that way, they, they're really setting themselves up to take this one pick and turn it into two to three years worth of giant building block picks. Um, if, if the deal goes the way it does. So there's a lot of excitement in that way. Um, and, and so for the, for the Chicago bears to say this, I, I know I went on a little bit of a tangent there, but what I truly feel is this morning, they've, I, I felt like the bears have always felt like Justin Fields was their guy. You knew watching the tape of all these guys coming out this year that, um, that fields, if he was in this draft would be looked at as number one or number two, overall pick your preference. They, they feel great about what they already have in their building. They already know him. They already see the, 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 um, the ceiling. And so I think the bears are, are truly feeling like they're close to a deal with the team, but they're going to, they're, they're putting it out there for that one last hail Mary phone call of our mm -hmm. ID. Uh, get that big time deal because they would love to get, trust me, you'd love to get one of those teams from 10 to 15 to offer you this year's first next year's first and 2025's first. You'd love that San Francisco type gigantic deal because that gives you the most flexibility overall. And you can still get yourself the, maybe the best wide receiver in the draft or the second best offensive lineman in the draft or the second best edge rusher, edge rusher in the draft being in that 10 to, you know, 15 range.
Sure. Yeah, that that would be ideal. I and like you said, there's probably not a prospect that would garner that type of haul for them uh to to trade up. But there are five teams really in the top ten that need a quarterback. That being the the Texans, Colts, uh Falcons, Panthers, and um well, actually the Raiders and Seahawks even too. So there's six of the top ten yeah. that that could really use it. There's quite a few of them that probably feel if we stay patient, we'll get because, like you said, with, with not a clear number one. Although you know, some people will argue Bryce Young is still the the number one quarterback. The there the three are pretty close together with C.J. Stroud and Will Levis, uh, and and who don't maybe someone prefers Anthony Richardson, but but there are three that pro, that fit much closer together than maybe the fourth outlier. However, you kind of determine that. Maybe some of these teams feel if they stay pat and patient, they'll be able to get one of those guys that they want. However, that being said, the further out you get to that number 10 to 15 range, they're in that range for a reason, meaning they might be just that one pick away from uh, having a good record next year, in which case that pick that the Bears get is going to be in the mid to late round next year. So if you trade with the Colts, who have the number four this year, they're likely not going to have a huge turnaround in 2023 to where they're picking now at 24th uh, next yeah. season. So that's what, I mean, if you're the bears, you also got to take into effect in, into effect uh, that position might dictate a little bit about what you value those picks as being from the Texans, from the Colts. And on top of that, if you trade down with those guys, let's say you trade down with the Texans so that Texans can go and get their guy and then you trade out again to to seven, that would be ideal because you still pick top 10. You still might have a chance at uh, Will Anderson or Jalen Carter at that point if you're picking seventh. And now you've acquired probably four draft picks from trading down twice. Four still first inside rounders the top 10. at that point. Yeah. Uh, and, yeah. And, and, you know, Dan, so much of this is going to lead into the talk we're about to start with Derek Carr is that to me, as a Bears fan right now, I am hoping Derek Carr goes to the Jets because if Derek Carr goes to the Jets over Carolina, over Atlanta, over New Orleans, the desperate NFC South teams for a quarterback, then all of a sudden, if the Bears say they do make the trade with Indy, Indy Houston, then one, two are going to take quarterbacks. Let's just say for the sake of argument, Stroud and Young are gone by one, two. Levis and Richardson then are the two left. You're sitting at four. Now people are fighting over that. Yeah. You're sitting sure. at four. And yeah. if you're all of a sudden saying to yourself, if you're a New Orleans or a or a Carolina and you really love one of these guys or an Atlanta, you're saying to yourself, crap, I gotta get ahead. I don't want, I do not want Anthony Richardson to end up in Carolina and I got Cam Newton 2.0. You know, if you're the Falcons. You call Chicago, you get up again, and you move up. So, to me, that helps create the urgency if if Derek Carr is in the Jets. Now, if he's in New Orleans, Carolina, you know, Atlanta, there's still going to be two teams. Which you, you always got to look at the teams in division, right? The fact that it's Houston 2, Indy 4 is so good for Chicago because it creates mm. that Indy. You know, Houston may still not be out of it for trading for the first pick. Because they, the last thing they want is they don't want the Colts to to leave. They don't want Indy to jump ahead of them. And all of a sudden Indy gets the guy and then they got to, they got to watch Bryce Young torch them for the next five years in division. And it, and it's killing them because, because of what Lovey Smith and then they refuse to trade up. Um, So there's a lot, there's a lot that can happen for Chicago. Either way. I think the only thing that would be a disappointment to me right now is if the Bears are drafting number one overall. Uh, if the Bears are drafting number one overall, the the two elite defensive prospects, you know, you put them either way you want, you know, one or one or one ahead of the other. Um, neither of them feel like, oh, that's a number one pick. You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. Neither of them feel like they're both terrific looking prospects and I uh, and and great players, but I would much rather get them at four with some capital, right? Yeah, with, yeah. with with some other things. And you so, can, that's the thing. I mean, you're, yeah. you'd, you'd be pretty confident that Houston isn't got, I mean, I know D'Amico yeah, Ryans right. is, you know, now there and he's a big defensive guy and all of that, 
but you would you would like to think that they're going to take a quarterback. So you're really yeah. only competing with uh, you know the number three pick at that point, uh, which is the Arizona Cardinals. And yeah, they probably take one of them. But you feel confident? Well, we like both. We'll get one of the two. But the Cardinals also, yeah, the Cardinals just got a defensive head coach, so obviously that is that, that's something to look at. But and what mm. their philosophy, and they have a new GM, what their philosophy is going to be. Um, but the Cardinals, would it shock you if they also realize, hey, you have some great, you want to take the best offensive lineman on the board, you know what I mean? Building around Kyler Murray in the future, you know what I mean? Um, it it is, the Cardinals are going to be very interesting. Well, the Cardinals also could be in a place to trade out. You know what I mean? Like they, they're probably, they're probably making calls open for business as well. Um, and they're in a really good spot as well because you don't have to give as much to get to that three as you would one, but you are you're that three is going to be the Cardinals. The Cardinals are, I'll put it this way. They are praying and hoping that, uh, that Indy moves uh, to number one, because then they are like, they are like um, what's, you know, the two years ago, I can't remember who is it three that San Fran traded to get to three, but they're in that spot where, was it New York? Maybe I, I don't I, remember you know what? who it was, know. but I don't know. Someone was at someone was in that three spot, and they got a yeah. ton of ton of stuff from they San got, Francisco. They got a massive haul, yeah. For so sure. they're in a good they're yeah. in a really good spot if they want to trade out of that. If if Houston, because then um, they're saying to themselves, Chicago's not going to take a quarterback at four, but we're if you want to if you want to get ahead of you know whoever's trying to trade for Chicago, like th- there's to be. I'll just put it this way. There could be a ton of movement, ton of movement at the top of the draft. Chicago at this point in time, um, I, I, I said it, I said it when um, the news broke this morning on my, on, on my uh, other shows page. And I stand by it. If in, if in 10 years from now, Justin Fields never materialized and he was just an okay player and they never signed him to a long-term deal and, and he, and his career fizzled out. And Bryce Young or C.J. Stroud or Will Levis goes on to be a Hall of Famer. Uh, I will eat crow, but as of today, as of this morning, I feel way more confident in what I know of Justin Fields, his ceiling, and with this organization than I do throwing away Justin Fields and putting all my eggs into one of those guys' baskets. Especially in the sense that you know it's the same kind of t- Taylor's oldest time argument as people say. Will the Bears draft a missile Trubisky over Patrick Mahomes? Patrick Mahomes would not become Patrick Mahomes with the Chicago Bears organization. It, the Bears are not built <laughs> good not, enough yeah. to do that. They're just not. So I certainly don't trust a, a tiny undersized um, Alabama quarterback who played in good weather in his high school career and his college career and young in Chicago. I just don't. Stroud to me is a maybe a little bit more of a polished pocket passer than 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 Fields coming out, but Fields was more impressive in his leading his team to that gigantic big uh, college playoff win against an all time great Clemson team. Um, and Fields was is way more of the athlete for the modern NFL that I like than Stroud. Levis is a big, more prototypical prospect. But there's a reason why Levis couldn't elevate his teammates in the SEC. Yeah, accuracy and, issues. And and Richardson's the same thing. Richardson is an explosive, incredible athlete with the ball He's travels with the, with the ball travels at the flick of the wrist, and he runs really, really well. But I don't think he's as good of his runner as Justin Fields. And Justin yeah. Fields, the ball explodes out of his hand with the flick of the wrist. So I'm like, I, I don't. I don't get yeah. trading the raw prospect for the raw prospect you already have. I, I so yeah. like I've said before, if it was if it was Caleb Williams number one overall and it was him here, I would have a really tough time with this because I love Justin Fields, but Caleb Williams appears to be the next up. Like he appears to be a kind of a can't miss prospect. It would be a much better sports talk show, you know, topic. It's just not yeah. that. The ESPN tried to make this a controversy. It's not a controversy. Fields is the better solution for the Bears than any of these guys. And uh, I'm glad to see that they're, that it appears to me as though 
that we knew all along. The pick will be traded. Now they just got to find the right trade partner to hope capitalize as much as possible off this pick. Well, that'll transition us into the uh, other quarterbacks being discussed. Derek Carr, obviously without a home right now, has his pick of the litter, and he'll have yeah. people fighting over him. Reports coming out recently that uh, he is requesting $35 million per year, which honestly, I mean, it's a great deal. By that's him. a pretty good deal. And and he's doing it so that these teams can afford to build stuff around him. He's at the point in his career where he's got to start getting some playoff wins if he wants to be considered. I mean, I don't think I know that there were reports that said the Jets feel that he could be a Hall of Fame quarterback with them. Yeah. I'll, OK, whatever. But first, if he wants Hall to be Fame. considered. Yeah. First ballot Hall of Famer at that. No, if he wants to be considered someone in the Hall of Very Good in in the vein of like approaching maybe like a Philip Rivers or something like that, he's going to need to be a part of a team that can start to build around him and win now. And that's going to require him to not have them t- uh, give him a $50 million cap hit uh, to the team. So $35 million per year seems to be a reasonable price for an above average quarterback in the NFL. So... That brings us to to the suitors. Obviously, the Jets right now, all of the reports are s- saying that they're the front runner. Um, New Orleans is another team that really could be considering bringing him on board. I feel like Carolina doesn't necessarily seem as good of a fit, but who knows? I mean, I feel like in terms of the coach relationship, Reich and Derek Carr seem to be probably about as good of a pairing as you can find. They're both super religious guys. Uh, they're they're both very professional in how they conduct themselves. Derek yep. Carr is very much a team player, and we know that Frank uh, kind of gravitates towards those types of guys. Uh, you know, and, and he has the the pedigree to kind of elevate uh, the the staff around him and the players around him. Does Frank? So that that seemed like that'd be a good fit. But in terms of the environment, uh, I'm not necessarily sure uh, that Derek Carr would work as well within the system and the weapons that they have there. Uh, but, you know, who knows? That certainly could happen. Where do you see the best fit for him? And where then maybe maybe it's the same answer. Where do you see him ultimately actually ending up? So I, I love what he's saying money wise, because, well, first off, a, you know, he's got the luxury compared to Daniel Jones. The rumors are Daniel Jones is looking for 40 something million. Yeah, that's um, insane, dude. He's not going to get that. I don't hate him asking for it because he's never got the big payday, right? Like the rookie contracts now are good. If you're a first yeah. over, if you're a first round draft pick, your money's good. Like it's pretty darn good. But but it's not Sam Bradford of it's like It's not like what it was. Yeah, you know what I mean? 20, but if you're 20. smart with it, if you're smart with it, it's you can turn it into generational money, thirty yeah, million. Yeah. You know what I mean? And you invest it. You're smart. You should be fine. So Derek was a second round pick, so he never got that. But he did get and went through his whole big contract with the Raiders, which was over a hundred million dollars. I'm sure he, I'm sure he's, he's looking at this and he's smart and he knows uh, that he's going to be fine. Like I, I I think it's smart of him to be looking for like, Hey, I'm just looking for 35 million a year. You know what I mean? (laughs) Nothing too crazy. I think it's really smart of him and his agent to do that. For sure. Um, If I'm Derek, I want the NFC South. If I'm Derek, I look at the NFC South and I think Atlanta and Carolina would, to me, be more attractive than New Orleans because they're both offensive head coaches, right? Uh, And they both um, have offenses that have some weapons. You have a receiver in DJ Moore. You have a number one. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. In 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 uh, in uh, 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 Atlanta, you have a tight end who's going to be your number one, right? And Drake London. And Drake London, spent, yeah. Know, so, yeah, they, so, they got some weapons. Uh, New Orleans is interesting. It would worry me a little bit because I don't know if I trust the coach. You have a lot of weapons, but there's a, there's a legacy and a and a living up to Drew Brees thing that if I'm Derek Carr, I don't know if I want to get involved with, but it could be worse. I, I mean, you'd say to yourself, do you have the confidence to go in there right away and win that division? I feel like yeah, you might be able to just because – it's not like New Orleans is trash. They have good players, and that division's bad. So all of that to me is favorable. Is Tampa now, in play? I don't know if I'd want Tampa because I think Tampa's ready for a gutting, and I don't I don't trust the coach. They should be in play. Fair they should call him. But if I'm Derek, they would be fourth out of four in that, in that division, division for me. Yeah, gotcha. Um, 
If I'm Derek, I look at the Jets as very attractive because of the offensive line, very attractive because of the young weapons and the improved young defense. But if I'm Derek, I look at the AFC and I'm just like, do I want to do this again? Do I want to stay in the AFC and be, you know, the eighth best, ninth best quarterback in just your conference? Um. If I'm Derek, I said to myself, the only thing I have to gain right now is playoff wins and success. And that is going to be easier in the NFC. If I'm looking at the AFC, though, the Jets are probably the, my favorite job available in the AFC because you only have to battle Allen. Getting a wild card spot in the AFC East would be easier because you can maybe stack some wins uh, against, uh, you know, against. Uh, Nah, I don't know. If you, yeah, if it'd be you, hard actually because you know if two was remotely better, she which you hope he is, yeah, more healthy. But, it might be a little bit more crowded than we think. But the north is the north. There's the north is brutal, so you don't want to go there. And there's no opening in the north. the The west there's no opening that's taking you because you're leaving the west opening. And then you know the south. Um. You're not going to Houston because they're not Houston ready to win not, anytime. Houston's not going to be in the yeah. dare. They want to start Indy, fresh. Indy could make sense. Indy but do they want to sense. do this again? Do they want but, uh, to go the I veteran think, quarterback route? You know, yeah. That's yeah, I, I think I think they want fr- new rookie head coach, rookie quarterback. Let's start a new thing. So, yeah, yeah. I mean, I think it's the NF- – the only other things in the NFC that make sense, I would seriously consider the commanders because of Eric Bieniemy. And they've been very Fair. quiet. They keep saying Sam Howell, Sam Howell, Sam Howell. But if you can get Derek Carr for $35 million a year, I would I would absolutely consider that. Um I think if you're I think if you're if you're Derek, you just gotta uh you have some good options. Like you have good options, and I think uh I think you gotta wait to see the landscape. I would wanna sign before the draft though. I would want to make sure I would want to know where I'm going before the draft. I would want to know where I'm going before the Lamar Jackson thing as well. You don't want to lose out on your opportunity to Lamar getting traded or one of these teams just deciding last minute, we're going to go in with a rookie quarterback. Uh, I, if I'm Derek's agent and an agent is what we'll talk about a lot here with Lamar coming up in a second, I would force, I would start forcing the hand of some of these teams and, and get a deal done and get where you want to go uh, to your best scenario here quicker uh, just because you you don't all of a sudden want to then be a little bit like now I'm only stuck with one or two options versus four or five because the draft has come and gone and the landscape shifted. And you just don't want to be behind the eight ball and getting to know your teammates. I mean, the yeah. sooner he can get guys down to Florida to throwing, uh, you know, some routes here before OTAs and before all of that happens – you know, the better he'll be off um, in the in the long run. So, yeah, I totally agree with you there. Let's shift gears to Lamar Jackson, who has been all over various reports. It's really hard to figure out who's wh- which reports uh, accurate, which are not. You know, a lot of th- this whole time we've been hearing that Lamar has been requesting fully guaranteed money on par or more than that of the Deshaun Watson contract, which, of course, was two hundred and thirty million now we're hearing uh, from kind of conflicting sources. Uh, you know, Jeremy Fowler has kind of been talking about the fully guaranteed deal. Well, Stephen A. Smith now has said that he talked to Lamar Jackson's camp, and they said that they've never put a fully guaranteed deal out there on the table. Yeah. Hard to kind of figure out what's what here. It, I, I will say this. It is seeming increasingly, and this is, I'm not, you know, this, I'm not, uh, you know, shattering any, uh, any windows here everyone's pretty much uh, been along for this ride it doesn't seem like he's going to be a Baltimore Raven you know coming up it really is becoming more and more clear that uh, this guy is going to because Baltimore's only recourse now is to slap the franchise tag on which they very well might do but I think based on what we saw kind of what happened with the playoffs this past year and Lamar kind of prioritizing you know, his health, but also seeming like he was going to say, well, if you're not going to guarantee me, then I'm not going to play. He who's to say he's not going to just sit out the franchise and hold out. And does Baltimore really want to deal with a year of purgatory with that happening and those distractions uh, rather than just move on? So that's the biggest thing there. Um, 
I I see him leaving Baltimore, not being a Raven this upcoming season. And it's going to be fascinating. I mean, most people right now considering Atlanta to be the top bidder. Uh, but I mean, I could easily see him being in New York all the same. So I mean, where do you stand on this whole Lamar Jackson situation? Well, th- and should he get gar- a fully guaranteed contract? It's what makes everything else hard. And I think that's part of where Derek Carr is in a purgatory is because the Jets are in on Aaron Rodgers and Lamar Jackson, obviously ahead of Derek Carr. It is seeming, though, the Atlanta Hawks are in on Lamar Jackson and drafting a rookie ahead of Derek Carr. You know, it seems like the Panthers are in on drafting a rookie ahead of Derek Carr. So there's it's all these layers. That's why I said, yeah. if you're Derek, find the team that, that, that does want you, that is willing to take that deal that you and your agent are happy with, and, like, make the move sooner rather than later. Um, so if... I agree with you. I think it is becoming more increasingly likely that Lamar is traded. Atlanta makes a ton of sense. If I was Atlanta, I would be I would be saying take number four overall or wherever they're at. Um, where are they at? Five? They're, uh, no, they're no. at uh, they're at eight, I believe. Uh, well, they're down at eight. They are eight. They are at eight. Take yeah. number eight overall. We'll give you next year's number one. We'll give you um, this year's. Uh, you know, three, you know, or two or whatever, and maybe next year's, you know, you know, three or two. And, um, but they may not have to give up that much because they know Baltimore doesn't have a whole lot of leverage. I mean, they Baltimore does in the sense that they have the franchise tag, but Atlanta could say, do you, do you want to roll the dice on that? Because that's your only play here. And I don't think that's giving up too much. If you give up this year's eight next year's one, and, you know, ne- this year's three or next year's three or something like that. You know what I mean? Yeah, I, I don't mean, think there that, are, for sure. Yeah. I don't think it's giving up the the earth, the moon, the sun, and the stars. Um, But, yeah, I, I think um, if I'm if I'm at, if I'm any of those teams, first off, A, let's just be clear. Let's be very clear. If I am a team in the NFC, in the National Football Conference, I am absolutely calling the Ravens about Lamar Jackson. If I am the NFC South, I'm calling every day. If I'm the commanders, I'm calling every day. If I'm the giants, I'm calling every day. If I'm, you know, uh, San Francisco, I'd be calling every day. Like, honestly, like here's Trey Lance and a couple of future first round picks. Like I'm calling every day. There are very few teams in the NFC that shouldn't be calling every day. Lamar Jackson and getting him at being a team in the NFC and getting Lamar in the NFC, you instantly become a top four team in the NFC. Like, like because of the dearth of quarterbacks yeah. in the NFC. So I, I think it's uh, I think it's hugely important. And if I'm an AFC team and if I'm the Ravens, I would ask for more trading him in the AFC. It's similar to what the Packers are saying with Rodgers. I, we will ask for less if it's an AFC team versus an NFC team. Um, I think that Lamar Jackson, let me, now let me be very clear on this point. I think the biggest mistake Lamar Jackson's making in his career is not having an agent for, for multiple reasons. An agent will be able to get you real drummed up interest and talk behind the backs with other agents without the NFL knowing. And we'll be able to give you the right information about where to go, how to negotiate these deals and where to go. So we're not there. That team's not giving up too much and to lay all the foundation of all of this. Also Lamar, what is the most important thing to you? If it's the guaranteed money, just because you're getting traded to a team doesn't mean they're going to give you the guaranteed money. It doesn't mean that. Mm -hmm. And I also on the flip side will say, Kudos to the Baltimore Ravens. This is going to take a lot of guts. It's going to take a lot of cojones. And it is going to maybe embarrass you for a couple years while Lamar goes and has a ton of success somewhere. But if I'm the Lamar, if I'm the Baltimore Ravens or any NFL franchise, if your name is not Patrick Mahomes, I am not giving you fully guaranteed money. I'm not giving Joe Burrow for a guaranteed money. I'm not giving uh, I'm not giving Jalen Hurts fully guaranteed money. I wouldn't have given Josh Allen fully guaranteed money. 
I am not giving anyone fully guaranteed money. I'm just not. And I'm not giving anyone even close to the fully guaranteed money that the Browns gave Watson. Yeah, exactly. I give them a ton of credit for having a spine and doing this, even though it could be very embarrassing for them in the years to come. But they have Huntley, and they will have an ability, I think, to work and find their quarterback. You know, there's going to be quarterbacks available out there this year and next year in the draft that um, could fit right in with Baltimore. It's just the shame that it's kind of come to this point because, I mean, just like looking back to the MVP season of 2019, it seemed like the, the Ravens were on this ascent. I mean, they they were really the talk of the AFC at that point. It was like we're, we've got the Chiefs, and then we're going to have the Ravens because even the Bills then were still kind of in that, uh, you know, Josh Allen – uh, working to improve phase. Meanwhile, the Ravens sit here with the MVP of the league. And now a few short years later, he's been injured. They haven't had much playoff success, which is surprising. If we would have bet back in 2019, would have thought for sure this team would have gotten to an AFC championship game uh, in the years to come. It just hasn't worked out that way. And here we are where Lamar may be going to the AFC South with the Atlanta Falcons. And they might be three years away from, you know, being legitimate contenders. Yeah. So it sucks for Lamar. It sucks for the Ravens in a way too. And it's just all around it. I mean, that's, but that's the nature of the league, man. It's like, it just shows like how quickly things can unravel. And, and it really has, I mean, injury, uh, be- your best ability is availability. And yeah. that really, really just throws a wrench into everything. Well, it just kills you because Lamar, and Baltimore should be a pairing for the next five years, and they should make a real yeah. run in it. And if you were to sign him to with the Kyler Murray deal, well, a little bit more than that, yeah, you would it wouldn't that. be it wouldn't be that crazy. Like the Ravens could still operate, could still move, could still work some stuff around. But as soon as you start talking about the money that he wants, uh, you're all you're gonna do with the Ravens, you're gonna be settling for second place in your division and early playoff exits for the next five years. I'm sorry, that, that it's just what you're going to be settling for. In the AFC, it's too tough. In the yeah. AFC, there Lamar, on his best days, can beat the best of the best in the AFC. I firmly believe that. On his best day, he can beat Patrick Mahomes. I, get, I believe that. But if you want to continually compete and continually be the team – that is battling the chiefs in the AFC championship game. I'm sorry. You cannot, uh, you cannot be absolutely hogtied by a fully guaranteed contract. The the Browns are going to find that out and the Bengals have to walk this line really carefully. And it's going to be interesting. Now the difference is Burrow's contract. And I think Burrow is going to be smarter about this. Burrow, I think is going to, is going to want the Josh Allen deal. I want eight years with a little less guaranteed, and let's spread this puppy out. Um, and I'd be willing, if I was the Bengals, to do close to what the ba- what the Chiefs did with, with Mahomes. Let's just lock you in at $40 million a year for 10 years. Yeah. You know what I mean? Let's just do it. Because for the next three years, it's going to be tough. But in five, six, seven years from now, like when Mahomes is only making $48, 45000000 million, and Burrow's only making 48, 45 million, five, six, seven years from now. That's insane. Like that's going to be the, that's going to be such a steal. It's going to be incredible for their, for their ability to continue to be battling for championships. Um, and they are the type of players that I would sign long deals with. I'm sorry, Lamar and my own guy, Justin Fields. And, and it's one thing I praise the Cardinals for the Kyler Murray deal. It was only five years because I only want Kyler for the next five years of his career. I don't want Kyler six years from now. I don't want Lamar and my team six years from now. I'm sorry. I saw what happened to Cam Newton. I want you for the seven years, rookie year through like year seven, I'm willing to overpay you in the last year or two. And when your body is breaking down because you gave me so much success from years one through seven. But I'm not paying you year 10 and year 11 with the way that these modern quarterbacks play. You're in like a seven-year sprint, and you got to make the most of it and try to make as much money in that in that time. And Lamar has negotiated this so poorly because he doesn't have an agent. Now he's already in year five, and he hasn't gotten the big deal yet. 
And the big deal, it may not ever come because of the way he's he's demanding this money. If I trade for him, I'm Atlanta. I, I'm not signing him to a guarantee, fully guaranteed deal. I'm hoping yeah. he's willing to sign a more reasonable deal just because he's in a new place and you just take it with that. But uh, if, if he's going to hold out until you sign him, I'm, I just can't do it. I mean, just from a messaging standpoint, I think you you hit the nail on the head with getting an agent because you need to get out in front of the narrative that's out there. If it is true that he has not requested fully guaranteed money, as this most recent report states, like you would have benefited from that getting out there much earlier to squash yeah. the narrative because the narrative out there for months has been that you are this, you know, greedy, uh, you know, try, trying to take advantage of your positioning uh here and and so if it is true you would have benefited from people who know how to kind of get these things yeah, out no. there and so that's going to be the biggest hurdle i think and i think you're correct that uh you know he just needs to get an agent out there but uh final thoughts mark before we uh before we toss this one to uh to our next show uh, my final thoughts would be i think the ravens coaching staff are, is going to is going to this is going to go on i don't see lamar getting traded before the draft. I, I, I just don't, I think they're going to really keep trying yeah. on this thing. Um, and maybe the night before the draft, you, you might see something like it's going to be a let or 11th hour day of, if they really feel like it's getting ugly, but I do think they're going to keep working on it. I, and I do think they know the franchise tag would officially kill it. Like if they, if it gets to the point where they have to tag him, then they know it's, it's dead and they might as well trade him. And I think, I think, to me, if I'm Derek Carr, push, keep pushing for the NFC South. Push one of those teams to sign you sooner rather than later. And if I'm the Chicago Bears, um, may, look to make that deal from one to two or one to four in the hopes that you could then spin another trade and you really set yourself up to take in a ton of talent this year and early next year or be really flexible so next year, you can be aggressive and trade up for a, a star receiver or a star left tackle that you might want uh, in the draft. Uh, give yourself this window so you're going into Justin Fields' year five, you've picked up the option, and you have an, uh, a, a really incredible foundation that you've built over the next two years. Like That's the, that's the game plan. Appreciate everyone tuning in. This has been the Football Lounge with Mark and Dan. Plenty of content coming your way over the next several weeks, so stay tuned.